Welcome to the NGO Whisperer Show in partnership with Behenet. This is a show that celebrates men and women from around the world who are impacting people's lives. My name is Caroline Opinde. I am the founder of the NGO Whisperer. We are a consulting business that helps nonprofits raise funds so they can successfully impact people's lives. Today, we are blessed to have Peter Kozanik from Connecticut, all the way from the United States of America, joining us via Zoom. Peter is a global connector where he connects people and create programs that are impacting lives of people. Today, he's going to share with us how he is connecting health practitioners in Africa with business executives to build systems that last. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Caroline. Pleasure to be with you today. It is such a pleasure to have you and to learn from you and the amazing things that you do as a global connector working in the health system strengthening. Would you please tell us, how did your journey all begin into this work that you do with uh, give back, which is your organization, and also connecting health practitioners in Africa with business executives in the United States. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I started Give Back Global uh, after spending about 14 years working for an international nonprofit in Connecticut that sent uh, experienced business executives to developing countries around the world to train and mentor young, less experienced managers. And we worked in every imaginable industry and service area um, that you can conceive of. Um, when I started at this nonprofit in late 1991, we sent about 2,200 business volunteers to developing countries around the world. Uh, that number dropped over the years, but I always believed uh, strongly in that model. So in uh, 2006, uh, the organization relocated to Washington, D.C. to be a little bit closer to uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, which was their prime funding source. Um, I was offered the opportunity to relocate to Washington, D.C., but I wanted to remain in Connecticut where I have uh, my family and where I've spent most of my life. So I resolved to remain connected to this business model, sending uh, experienced volunteers overseas to train and mentor less, uh, less experienced business managers. What, uh, what I strive to find was a, the appropriate niche uh, so that I could remain active and involved. And so uh, I, I spent literally four or five months researching various options and I came upon uh, the, the idea of working in the health, global health space. And this uh, idea was cemented when in uh, the spring of 2006, I uh, attended a global health and social entrepreneurship conference at Yale University, not far, far from where I live in Connecticut. And one of the keynote speakers at the conference said something that had tremendous impact uh, on me. And uh, what he said was, in developing country health, the consequences of bad management are fatal. In developing country health, the consequences of bad management are fatal. And that was a very, very powerful statement for me. Uh, I didn't quite understand uh, the context and what he meant exactly. So I spent more time researching it, and uh, ultimately I, I assembled my facts, I looked at the data, and I concluded that global health was a good niche for uh, Give Back Global. And so in 2006, I launched, and here we are in 2019, 13 years later. It's taken me about 13 years to become an overnight success. Um, not that I'm a success yet, but uh, we feel we've made some, some real impact and we're convinced we're on the right track. Absolutely, thank you so much. Over a decade making an impact 
in the health systems in different countries in Africa. I know you work in a number of countries through your organization that you founded, Give Back Global. Could you please share with us what that looks like? Well, um, one of the obstacles that I confronted at the outset was um, my expertise is, it is really in the systems and the processes that are required to send uh, business volunteers to developing, developing countries. So uh, I, I knew that the processes, the models, the practices, uh, what I didn't know was anything about global health. I didn't know anything about Africa. I didn't know anything about healthcare in the US. And I didn't have any connections in, in healthcare in, in the US or Africa. So the learning curve was very steep. Um, but, uh, you know, to overcome that, I had to do my research. There are no, there are no shortcuts on this path. And uh, so I've been plugging away, grinding it out. Initially, my uh, biggest concern was selecting a country uh, in Africa where I could pilot this model of sending business volunteers to, to work with uh, health managers in Africa. Um, I tried a number of countries. Uh, specifically Malawi, Zambia, Namibia, Botswana. And uh, what I learned was for me to, to try a pilot program, I needed permission from the ministries of health. Uh, so I took that information, I crafted a beautiful email to the ministers of health, uh, and then the result was deafening silence. You couldn't, I didn't get any responses. Ultimately, I was connected with someone in Uganda where the health uh, system has devolved and decision-making authority uh, goes out to the, uh, to the local level. So I was able to pilot a program in Uganda. Uh, from there, we did a handful of projects. When did the program in Uganda start? The program in Uganda started in 2013. Um, and so we did a handful of projects there. Then I concluded that rather than doing these so-called one-off projects, individual projects, I thought I could make more impact if I thought more programmatically, more big picture. So I, by this time I had, uh, I had partners in Uganda and in Kenya, and I, I challenged them to think big and figure out a way where we could implement this model um, in their countries um, on a nationwide basis. So uh, we've been pushing this and pushing this and grinding away for the last few years. Um, ultimately, what I'm most excited about is my partnership uh, in Kenya. We have, uh, rather than doing on-site, one-on-one -on -one projects, which can be expensive. Um, what, we've, what we've established is a new innovative virtual mentoring pro program called Wired for Excellence. And uh, this is a, pr a program that uh, we launched in January of 2019, six months ago. And uh, it connects um, young, up-and-coming, mid-level and senior level Kenyan health managers with uh, very experienced U.S. healthcare executives. So uh, people how, who spent how, does, how does Wired for Excellence work? Is it like an app on a phone or do you need a computer to log in and learn from your, uh, the, their peers in the United States? How does that work? Yeah, we don't have an app, although we have been approached by app developers, and that's very intriguing. We're looking at that, that as a potential path in the future. Uh, we don't have a dedicated website for Wired for Excellence either. So uh, the, the way we're, we're doing it, uh, my partner in Kenya is uh, finding mentees in his country. Mostly it's by referral. Um, these, the mentees typically are hospital administrators or deputy administrators um, or program managers for health NGOs. And we're connecting, my, my role in this is to connect those mentees with hospital executives. Um, people have spent two or three decades on the operational side of 
healthcare. So these are not, the prevailing model really is um, when health system strengthening is taking place, the trainers are European or American um, consultants, many of them Beltway consultants from the, from the DC area, uh, or they're academics. Our model is completely different. We're using what I call practitioners as our mentors. People who um, have 30 years um, of, of experience on the operating side. So it's a completely different model. It's meant to complement the existing uh, efforts that are being done in health system strengthening. So at this point, it's all via Skype and email, uh, and, and, and it's working quite well. We, the first cohort of, uh, of program participants numbers 15 Kenyan mentees and 15 U.S. mentors. So in total, and you have a cohort of 30 people. 15 that's, that, Canada, that's right, that's and right. 15 from the United States of America working together via Skype, via email, and the U.S. executives experienced in healthcare, mentoring more junior and, and less experienced Kenyan uh, health uh, ex specialists or even people working in health-related nonprofit. So how long is the mentorship period? I know you said you started in January, but is yep. it going to be a year long or two years long? Or how, how do you see this uh, unfolding? So it's, it's a, what we call a structured mentorship program. My partner in Kenya has contracted with a, a UK-based educational consultancy that develops course content. And in this case, uh, they have a life skills course which uh, includes 16 different modules. Uh, each module can be completed online in two or three hours. And the modules uh, range, they, they can be broken down into two distinct areas. One is uh, key competencies, and that includes things like um, delegation, how to delegate, report writing, presentation skills, um, how to manage others. The other key comp the other uh, part of the program is working with others. So how to lead, how to manage, how to inspire, how to motivate, uh, things like that. So there's 16 in total. And uh, in theory, those modules can be completed in about three or four months, but uh, we are uh, giving everyone some time uh, to, to complete them. Uh, we're asking the mentors and the mentees to stay together for a period of nine months uh, to complete the program. When the program is completed by the Kenyan side, they'll receive certification uh, for completing the program. For this Ultimately, I will, mm -hmm. for this certification, are you working with a uh, with a uh, higher education institution, or is this uh, with the Ministry of Health? It's the Ministry of Health. Yes, so um, okay. ultimately our goal is to forge lifelong connections. Wonderful. Um, my experience at the, the nonprofit where I worked for, for more than 14 years, from 1991 to 2006, was that um, many of the, the people that I connected remained in touch with one another, not just for the duration of the on-site volunteer project, which was typically four to six weeks, they remained in touch with, uh, with one another, in some cases for, uh, for more than 10 years following the, the project itself. So I feel this model um, can be sustainable for the long term, and that's why I'm so excited about it. I am excited about it too. As you know, I'm Kenyan, even though I live in South Africa and partially in the UK where my spouse lives, but to see this unfolding in my own country uh, that previously had a health system that was degraded and now it's really coming up with the devolution of government, I am very much excited. Is there hope for this to be replicated in other countries in Africa? Absolutely. Um, we want to, we're using Kenya as our test market. 
Um, so we want to learn some lessons from this pilot program. I've already identified some areas that we need to, to, uh, to shore up and strengthen. For example, um, I need, we would like to get more feedback from both the mentors and the mentees. So we can build that in to uh, future iterations of this program. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced that there's a need and there's a demand for this service uh, beyond Kenya. Uh, so yes, we have been approached by uh, other countries to uh, establish a, a similar program as, as uh, Wired for Excellence. Um, the, the difficult part really for me from the, from the outset, from the establishment of uh, Give Back Global was uh, identifying and, and, and uh, choosing the right partners. That is 80% of the battle. So um, I want to make absolutely sure if we expand and roll this out to other countries, the, the virtual mentoring program, um, I want to make sure that I have the, the best possible partners. By partners, um, you mean local NGOs and yeah. hospitals yes. in the country? Yes, okay. absolutely. So Wired for Excellence, actually, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, Caroline, that I challenged my uh, partners to come up with a program. Uh, to come up with an idea. I didn't want to be someone sitting uh, in Connecticut 7,000 miles away from the beneficiaries and coming up with a program um, uh, strategy or ideas. I can give some suggestions, but ultimately it makes all the sense in the world for the, the uh, in-country folks, my partners in-country, to, uh, to develop the program specifics. They know... They know the needs more than anyone. Absolutely. Um, There's a saying within the nonprofit that goes, nothing for us without us. So when you present a program to the community, if you do not carry out any community consultations and engagements before designing a program, you are actually preparing to fail because absolutely. there is no buy-in there is no ownership of the program, and certainly there isn't going to be much to talk about sustainability because the local community, if they haven't bought into it, once the funding runs out, they're not going to put any effort to make it becoming success, uh, sustainable. And that is yes. one of the most beautiful things that I love about Give Back Global. You're not forcing your ideas all the way from Connecticut into the health systems in Africa, you're actually asking them, I am here, what can I help you with? And that's just so beautiful, you know? Absolutely. I, I, I'm drawn to it, and this is what drew me to your program in the first place when we connected. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. My, my, my role in all of this, I can give the... Uh, Kenyan health managers access to expertise, access to the U.S. Uh, mentors. Uh, but beyond that, um, I can give suggestions to my partners and I can listen to their ideas and encourage and motivate them. But ultimately, it's their call. I completely believe in that. And you're absolutely right. For, our, for a program to be sustainable in whatever sector we're talking about, it's got to be locally developed and uh, tailored and flexible to local needs. Absolutely. I also know you are planning to do some assessment in Uganda with your local partners. Would you please share with us what that's all about? Well, in uh, Uganda, my partner came up with an idea to have a nationwide training and mentoring program uh, in partnership with uh, Uganda Protestant Medical Bureau, UPMB. And uh, UPMB is a, a large uh, nationwide uh, health systems provider. They have 291 health facilities throughout the country. Many of them are, in re uh, are located in rural areas, hard to access rural areas. So his idea was Let's implement a training and mentoring program where we connect experienced U.S. healthcare executives with the heads of the clinics and the health centers and the hospitals that are under the auspices of UPMB. Um, 
so that was the plan. It would include, it's a, we developed a detailed proposal. We haven't shopped it out yet, um, but the, the proposal would include uh, on-site training and mentoring from experienced U.S. healthcare executives. There would also be some, uh, some online learning, such as, the, uh, you know, such as it's happening right now uh, in, in countries around Africa, distance learning. And also there would be some certifications. So it's, it's a composite of, of different approaches together we feel would be very powerful. So again, we haven't implemented anything. We, we need funding uh, before we can start, but we, we uh, have developed a proposal, as I mentioned, for a, what we call a situation analysis, which would uh, ultimately enable us to uh, further clarify some ideas and refine our scope of work uh, and then we could, from there, we could build build out a bigger program. So that's very exciting. Also, that's it's more complex and um, more in depth um, than than Wired for Excellence, our program in Kenya. Um, why, it has more why, risks. Why is the program in Uganda uh, more complex and in depth and different from Wired for Excellence in Kenya? It's, it's uh, more complex um, and more in-depth because it would include, as a major component, on-site volunteers. So the volunteers uh, travel from the United States and come to Uganda to the yes. 291 health facilities in rural areas. Yes, ultimately within a five-year period, that was the plan, to have established uh, basically mentors for, for the heads of all those 291 health facilities in Uganda. Um, so how so long would they be on site? Would it be? These would be short-term projects. Okay. Um, you know, typically, again, four to six weeks uh, might, be, might be the norm. They can be longer. Um, but any time you send people on site, uh, obviously that the logistics are more complicated, the cost rises, um, and it's just in general, it's more hard. To, it's harder to pull off. It's I've done it for years, uh, and I know and I know how to do it. Uh, but it's much more uh, c complex and, and more costly. Wired for Excellence, uh, being a virtual mentoring program, uh, it costs virtually nothing. Um, the the U.S. mentors are volunteers, um, so. It's, it's just easier to pull off. So people might wonder why, why is Uganda looking for a more complex, in-depth model? Why can't they just go with Wired for Excellence? We could do that. We could certainly do that and we might do that as a start, as, as a, a starting point. I, I actually think that would make a lot of sense. Um, I ha however, I believe that you can have more impact and more sustainability by p uh, placing experts on site. Absolutely. Um, I think real change uh, begins at the personal level. Thank so you. it's much easier to forge uh, personal connections and friendships, which can lead to real sustainable change when two people meet face to face and look each other in the eye and, and, and develop bonds. That's really how, how uh, measurable uh, long-term change can be affected. Um, the virtual mentoring is certainly very valuable and it can lead to some, some tremendous things and some, some real improvements in, in health systems. Uh, but um, ultimately, I believe uh, putting people on site can really create some magic. That is wonderful because I also believe I also believe that we can make good use of technology, and technology can take us up to a certain level. But however, when you look at human contact, especially when you are transferring knowledge to people who are saving lives 
of other people. The human contact is equally important. And whichever model you end up using, you know, it could be a hybrid of both. It could be, you know, the Ugandan model working later after you have tested wired for excellence. But I am with you on that. Mix of both technology and human contact, that would be the best aspect when it comes to empowerment of people. And I would also imagine that rural communities might find it very difficult to connect to steady internet for Skype conversations. And to have meaningful Skype conversations, you need proper internet connectivity, I would imagine. And some of those rural areas, as I know it, uh, being a Kenyan can be difficult. Uh, so that's, those could be some of the reasons why the local healthcare practitioners prefer to have mentors coming on site. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think probably the, the way we'll go will be some sort of a hybrid approach, but I couldn't agree with you more that, that um, on-site can be more impactful. Absolutely. And, um, you know, you know, there's several approaches to, to uh, transferring skills and, and knowledge. Virtual is one, but the on-site, I think, uh, certainly is, is another. And um, when you have someone on-site, you're really learning by doing. So you're not just uh, su making suggestions or telling someone what to do, but you're involving that person um, Together, you know, the, 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 the trainer and the trainee are working together uh, on site. And I, I feel the likelihood of, of the lessons being uh, learned by the, uh, the beneficiaries are, are greatly in, in increased by that approach. I mean, I, I was just thinking off the top of my head, um, this is a crazy example, but I, I recently had to assemble a piece of furniture yeah. And so I looked at the manual and it should have been an easy thing, but I absolutely, it, it, it baffled me. I couldn't figure <laughs> it out. So I looked online and there was a YouTube video. Yes. And that helped me. I finished part of the, the furniture, but ultimately I needed to bring someone in, a, a real live breathing human being to finish it for me. So um, that kind of uh, illustrates how uh, things get done. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I hope your furniture is all sorted out and no one is falling off. <laughs> it is, but, but I, now it turns out I don't like the piece of furniture, so I might, <laughs> I'll, I'll probably give it away. <laughs> that is quite a funny story, but really, it, 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 it's a good example when we're talking about the difference between the Ugandan model uh, of having mentors on site and the Wired for Excellence where mentors are joining through Skype and email and mentoring their mentees online. It's such yes, a yes. pleasure to have you. Uh, and I cannot wait to hear more about the expansion of the program. My question to you is, is South Africa where we are right now one of the countries on your list or are you looking at other more uh, countries that need this more than South Africa? I'm open to anything. I don't know anyone in South Africa. I don't have any potential partners, so I would welcome hearing from folks who believe well, in, in what we're doing. Now you and know us. Now you know I do. Us. That will help. <laughs> that will be helpful. So, now, so I do okay. want to mention uh, one other thing, and this is really why I'm so excited about the possibilities. Yes. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., we literally have, in my opinion, well in excess of 10,000 skilled and experienced healthcare business executives. Um, and, and no one is tapping into th that deep pool of expertise. So uh, that's what I'm really trying to do. I, I, I feel that in, in developing countries and in, in Africa, um, there's much more limited pool of, of, of know-how and knowledge um, so why not tap into really a, an untapped resource, which is uh, U.S. healthcare executives, people with an operating um, background, uh, hospital CEOs, hospital CFOs, human resources executives, uh, IT people. Um, there's a need 
for this type of expertise throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, my goal would be to figure out how to connect them with, uh, with people in, in Africa. So I, I believe there's an unlimited potential for what we're trying to do. Absolutely, and that is- But I, but I need partners. <laughs> and that is why we have this show, the NGO Whisperer and Behenet. You know us, now you are part of our community, and that is why we are here, to really impact lives of people. And Behenet as an established connector here in South Africa has so many connections that we can draw you to and draw you into in terms of, you know, connecting you with the right people and also with our partners that we're working with, because I believe there are some of them within the health sector who would be happy to sit with you and learn more about the models that would work for South Africa. And knowing you, I know you will want the South African community of health practitioners to come up with their own model and you will provide the expertise that's required to take their model to the next level. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. So everything is about partnership. Yes. Getting the right partnership, putting together the right model, um, and, and then of course funding. You need to put together a, a fundraising proposal that you can pitch uh, that includes a compelling argument for why this makes sense. And even what will, what will the negative effects be if you don't implement the model? That could be even more important. Um, so I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. I would welcome hearing from, from prospective partners who are committed to improving health systems in their own countries. Absolutely. And we will definitely keep in touch with you. And that is why, again, we have this show to showcase your work, to celebrate your work and also to connect you with potential funders, philanthropists, government officials who are interested in having this model and give back, actually give back to the health system in Africa. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Really thank you for making time. It's early in the morning in Connecticut and we are so happy to have you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Caroline. It was a pleasure to join you today. And uh, I really appreciate this forum and what you're doing. And I'm really impressed with your, with your vision. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. A global connector connecting health executives from the United States to health uh, junior health practitioners in Africa. And it's all about strengthening health systems in Africa so we can save lives of people all around Africa, whether it's in rural hospitals, peri-urban or even urban hospitals that, are, that have less experienced practitioners. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And together with our partners, Behenet, we want to say thank you so much for watching this video. If you would like to connect with us to learn more about what Give Back Global and Peter Kozanik do, please go to our website at Behenet or the NGO Whisperer, because it's all about connecting people, raising funds and impacting lives.